uh, it's a collection of publishers' findings. Uh, so I have two colleagues here today that are going to talk to you about that. So why don't you guys just introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about what you do here at Alden. Sure. Um, I am Miriam Intertor, responsible for Special Collections Librarian, responsible for rare books and for um, the documentary photo archive. Um, I've been here for about three and a half years, and I um, primarily do a lot of instruction related to the collections that I'm responsible for um, across departments all over campus. Um, and I'm also responsible for managing all aspects of the rare book collection primarily. Um, I'm Karen Beecroft. I'm Digital Projects Librarian for Digital Initiatives. So I take the stuff that you give me, Stacy, and that you give me, Miriam, um, and I create the digital images of it. I describe them, um, and then I make them available online. Cool. Um, okay, so but talking about this specific project, um, Miriam, could you tell us a little bit about what publishers' findings are and why they're significant? Yeah. Um, so publishers' findings are book findings that were designed sometimes by, but more often for a publisher, and then manufactured and used in quantity. Um, so they're significant because they are, uh, they illustrate the moment in the history of um, book making, book production, um, which occurred about 1830, um, when, when publishers um, needed to um, increase the speed and efficiency um, at which they were producing books um, for increasing demand in the marketplace. So um, publishers' findings, um, primarily of cloth, um, created a way for um, publishers to make books fully available as a, as a complete product more quickly to the marketplace. Um, because originally, um, or during the 18th century, um, books were um, generally bound um, later in the process by bookbinders or by consumers themselves um, who wanted very specific bindings for their books. So that was more expensive uh, and a more time consuming um, project. And so in order to make them, again, more affordable and more readily available, um, came the turn to um, publishers' bindings with the turn to mechanization and mass production distribution. Awesome. Um, okay, so these books, uh, Carmen, what parts of the books are you capturing for the digital project? Um, well, I will demonstrate with a book. Um, <laughs> we have the microscope here. Um, and so we would generally photograph the, uh, the case. So um, these are the cloth bindings that are put on during the manufacturing process. Um, so the front cover, the back cover, the spine. Um, we would also um, take a photograph of the front fixed flyleaf or end paper and then the first free um, flyleaf, um, especially if they are um, patterned in some way um, or show evidence of that manufacturing process. Um, we'd also um, take a photograph of any inscriptions um, that you would see. Sometimes those would be um, in, these, in this front matter here. Um, this is called the frontispiece. Um, it is often opposite the full title page, um, and it um, also was used in advertising, it was um, what was um, going to catch someone's eye when they open up the book. Um, as you can see, it's protected um, by a little piece of tissue paper um, that has been pasted in by the manufacturer. Um, so you can see how much they um, valued this. Um, and then also the full title, uh, mostly for our reference. Um, and then uh, we do the same thing um, for the last the last free flyleaf and the back fixed end paper. Um, so this was, um, Miriam and I came up with this um, set of images because we didn't want to address the, the whole page block because um, the text of this book has already been evaluated by Google Books, HathiTrust, some of the other huge um, digitization initiatives um, that took place um, beginning in like 2005, which have tens of millions um, of public domain works already available online. So we didn't want to reproduce that, but we did want to highlight the physicality um, of the book as an exemplar in the Mon Center collection um, and to, to, to show um, these manufacturing processes and the art specifically of how they appealed to this rising middle class and new educated population. Great. Um, and you're planning to connect the, the pictures that you take of our specific books with the, 
digital scans that already exist of the content as well, right? So yeah, um, so we have links um, in the records um, to similar editions right. that are already available online. They might not be exactly the same publisher, the same date, um, the same format, um, but the text is going to be um, as similar as we can get. And in some cases, they are exactly that. Um, and if you want to see exactly what this text looks like, you just come to the Mon Center. It's true. Um, OK, so how did you, Miriam, select the books that are in this collection? Because I know it's just a small subset of what right. we have. Um, so we started um, focusing a little bit on the juvenile collection, um, just because those tend to have um, really wonderfully um, illustrated publishers' bindings. Um, and some of the other things we were looking for were condition. We want bindings that are in pretty good condition um, so that they're, they you know, show up well um, online or still beautiful objects. Um, and also just showing a variety of the different types of images um, and stamping and um, typefaces and different things that you might see uh, on covers. Um, and there, it's important also to get sort of a range of time periods um, because the, um, what is on the cover can tell us a lot about what was popular at the time, um, whether none of these have people in clothing, but that's something that you can see, what was the style, what was the fashion, what was appealing to people. These were very much meant to appeal to the um, general reader. Um, and so, and something else that we wanted to show, like as with the um, microscope that Carmen already talked about, um, also the romance of modern astronomy, is that publishers' bindings were not just used with literary works. Um, this happens to be poetry. Um, but we have a lot of history of science books in the collection, and that's something else that we wanted to represent is sort of how broadly these were used. Um, and some of the different materials you can see right here, the, um, so often in the earlier ones, you'll see not too many colors or no color at all. You'll just see blind stamping, which might not show up here, um, but there is decoration. Um, it's just not um, colored in with either the um, aluminum or palladium or gold. Um, or other colors like um, black um, or red or any other color that you would um, see a little bit later. Um, and most often you'll see the um, front cover being um, most decorated and then the spine and then the back is often um, totally um, blank or um, has the same pattern as the front cover um, but just not filled in. So blind stamped again as we would call it. Um, so we were focused on good condition and just getting a range of, um, of styles and, um, and times um, and subject matters also. And I think something else we're going to do moving forward is maybe focus a little bit on Ohio imprints. Um, so bindings that were created by, um, by publishers in Ohio and for Ohio readers. Okay, great. I did not know that. Um, so that was my next question was to ask you a little bit about how your plans for growth. So definitely right. focusing on Ohio and Ohio publishers. To the extent we can. Okay. Yeah, um, I think that will be a good focus. And there's other projects out there similar. So um, I think that we're creating this, um, you know, again, to represent our collection specifically um, and the types of things that we have and so that it can be used also, um, you know, as a teaching, teaching tool, as a research tool, but also just as um, sort of the enjoyment of looking at these as beautiful um, physical objects that are representative of a specific um, moment um, in history and time in the history of um, technology and bookmaking and mechanization and manufacturing. Great. Um, okay, so switching gears to talk about the digital project. Carmen, can you give us some of the details of digitization, um, how you're capturing the images, mm -hmm. what kind of descriptive information that's going to be included in the collection? Yeah, um, so we have a digital camera. Um, it's the uh, um, the camera on a stick model of the coffee stand um, where um, the camera is uh, photographing these items from above. It's screwed onto a plate that is on um, another um, cross piece that can be adjusted up and down um, based on the size of the object and um, what the kind of image that you want to get. And so we have um, two commercial photography students who work during the regular school year um, who have experience with capturing objects specifically. Um, and that's important because, um, for example, this gold stamping um, has reflective properties. So they're using two soft boxes to, uh, to get the best image um, of the item um, and work with the item 
in order to um, to get the the most accurate um, and also the most visually appealing image. Um, so they're um, gently manipulating the book, um, and we have a variety of uh, braces and stands and and weights um, from our head of preservation here, Miriam Nelson, um, in order to hold the book um, while this is going on. Right. So how long would you say it takes probably for a student to capture I a think book? a student takes about 10 minutes to photograph it, um, and then they do a lot of post-processing work. Okay. Um, and then there's another student who's um, capturing the metadata, the description um, from the catalog records. Um, then that is embedded in the digital files. The files are um, changed to a, a different format from the, the raw files that they're working in um, when they're doing color correction and other editing. Um, in the image itself, um, and then I take all of that and um, ingest it. I, I add it to our uh, our database, um, and then um, it appears um, to the end user. Great. Um, so when users are looking at this digital collection online, are there any specific? And I know we've talked about like some of the different things that we that you're capturing, um, but specific features or specific items that they should be yeah. on the lookout for. Um, so we have been trying to um, specifically highlight um, the artists that are involved in this process. So um, a lot of these designs on the front cover um, would have a small monogram on there. Um, so it's a little symbol that. Um, uh, particular commercial artists um, used in order to, unfortunately it's not on one of these, um, mm -hmm. used in order to, um, to cue people in that this was their work. So um, there's some um, collaborative um, groups such as decorative designers, which are very famous. Um, there's a lot of women actually who um, would not otherwise have been um, surfaced in, in, in the advertising for this product. Um, versus the interior artists um, who often got um, credit by name. Um, and so it's much more likely to see a signature um, or um, other identifying information on the front piece or um, other plates um, inside the, the text block. Um, so we're really um, eager to see what um, threads we can pull out with that and um, give people a sense of um, all of the different personalities and decisions that went into um, bringing this all together. Right. Just to follow up on that a little bit, um, I think um, that often, like Carmen was saying, the um, book or the cover designer might not be actually attributed anywhere inside of the book. So the things that we're looking for are like initials um, or sometimes a little monogram, and they're often um, very small and sort of hidden, um, so you do have to look for them. There's some that are very well known. Margaret Armstrong, for example, she has a very recognizable NA that you can usually find pretty easily. Um, and they are often women, but also they were often well known at the time, you know, painters and designers who were also doing um, book design, and they often had relationships with specific publishers. And so um, if you um, see a design that looks sort of familiar and it's not signed and it's by the publisher that you know this artist regularly worked with, you can. Um, you know, you can guess or wonder if perhaps it is that artist because they were working with this particular publisher. Right. Um, okay, so just as the kind of the last thing, and we touched on this a little bit when you mentioned using this in the classroom and instruction and research, um, but just what are what is your ideals for how you would like to see this used? Um, I would love for it to be used as a complement to the actual books in the classroom um, on, when we're on talking about on-campus instruction. Um, I think it'll be very useful for the students to be able to see the books and then um, in class as well as on their own time um, spend a little bit more time with the website um, and um, look at their own book and compare it with other designs that they wouldn't necessarily have time to see in class. Um, so there'll be much more on offer basically um, when, they, when they go to the website and there are several instructors, professors who are um, teaching increasingly with history of the book kind of in mind, um, either as a main thread in their in their course structure or as an underlying thread. Um, so this will give them an additional tool to use um, with their students and in creating assignments and projects. Um, and there's a lot that you can do just with the images, um, you know, as, as Carmen was describing, uh, because we're capturing 
different elements of the book. So if you're interested in those signed bindings and the covers, you can focus on that. If you're interested in book plates um, and provenance and the history of ownership and usage, you can focus on the um, inscriptions and signatures and um, other markings left behind by, by people who have previously owned and used these books. Um, or, and if you're interested in the content, then you can you know, either follow the links to the digital versions or come to the Mon Center and look at the books um, in person. So we hope that there will be multiple possible uses and potentially also that student work on the books will allow us to perhaps add metadata that, mm -hmm. um, that will take the research beyond what we have been able to do yeah. on our own um, just based on resources. So um, that's another possibility that um, is very exciting. So. Great. Well, it sounds like a really wonderful collection. and. We'll add a link to it in the comments. Do you guys have anything else you want to? Yeah, I just want to say um, there's currently um, uh, about 56 items in this collection. So this is a soft open. We're going to have the link um, for you lucky uh, <laughs> Facebook Live viewers um, for you to be able to um, go in there and play around with it. Um, this process will be continuing indefinitely. Um, we have thousands of publishing findings um, in the Mon Center, and um, we have this process um, pretty well um, streamlined, so we can continue this as long as we have more books coming down. So this will, will grow quite a bit. Great. Well, thanks, you guys, and Thank we'll you. talk to you later.